Hey, welcome to the Fuel the Fight podcast. We have a very special episode uh, today um, because this is, I think, the the first episode we've had where actually one of my old bosses is is coming on the the episode. Um, we have Colonel Nicholas Gist uh, at the United States Military Academy. Um, he is a graduate there in '94. Uh, then went on uh, as a life science major. Went on to become an aviation officer. Uh, flew Chinooks. Then through the Army education process, was able to get his master's and doctorate at the University of Georgia. Go dogs! Uh, master's in exercise science, doctorate in exercise physiology. Um, has deployed both to uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, tremendous Army leader. Tons of experience. And now in his current job, has probably the coolest title in the Army, the Master of the Sword. Uh, so without further ado, please let me welcome uh, Colonel Nick Gist uh, to the podcast. Nick, thanks for having me. This is, this is really cool. Neat to connect with you. Uh, you haven't been gone that long, um, but it's neat to reconnect with you in this venue. And we're certainly proud of what you're doing down there in Texas. And I, I don't I want to get these in now. So yes, go dogs, national champs. They got the natty. It's been a while. Uh, go Army and beat Navy. Yes, yes, sir. And you, and you can't see in the studio. I have my my Army hat facing at my my camera. I have it out. You know, I sh- I should have brought my DPE mug. Um, but yes, definitely, definitely go dogs. Maybe we can get Kirby Smart on here sometime. Maybe uh, I, I'm sure I'm sure you have a connection. Um, w- one of the things I want to start off, sir. Could you just tell kind of your your Army story? What what brought you in, and and you know, kind of uh, what what brought you into the Army, and then why you serve. Yeah, um, so I have to go back quite a ways. Um, so didn't necessarily come from a military family. My dad did serve, and and you know very thankful for his and all the other vets' service to our nation. He was a, a Navy uh, petty officer. Uh, I think two or three Westpac trips during the Vietnam War on a destroyer you know, as an electronics technician. But he was he was he, I think he got out when I was about three years old, so I wasn't really exposed to it. I grew up in Southern California. Uh, near a town called Alpine on the east San Diego County. And I think as I, you know, kind of first few years in high school as I'm looking at options, I really, really wanted to wrestle in college. I wasn't quite, you know, getting the attention I needed to get. Um, So we started looking at other options um, to help pay for college in reality. I'll be very candid. And the military academies uh, looked, seemed like a tremendous option, right? Great education, uh, the ability to serve. I uh, didn't know much about what it meant to be an officer, um, but ultimately had a really good guidance counselor in my high school who explained the process, really spent time with a lot of the um, the kids in our high school, brought in military academy liaison officers, had other connections in the area. And I think both the influence of my parents, the influence of that uh, particular guidance counselor at the time, uh, got several of us interested in ultimately uh, I was nominated and received an appointment here to the Military Academy. My best friend uh, received the primary nomination and appointment to go to the Air Force Academy. Had another friend that was a recruited football player to the Air Force Academy. And then a fourth who got the primary nomination and went to the Naval Academy. And then, well, that's not all. There was one more who got a four-year Army nurse scholarship. And uh, so um, Southern California, uh, great military support, primarily Navy and Marine Corps. But I made the long trip out here to West Point in 1990 to join the Corps of Cadets. And as you said, I graduated in 1994. You know, the Army story after that, I'd say, is some of it's typical, maybe some of it's atypical. Uh, I am an aviator, uh, flew Hueys. Yes, I'm that old. I flew Hueys for a while. Uh, and then transitioned to Chinooks. A um, couple of tours in Korea. Uh, spent about four years over there total. Uh, as you mentioned, a uh, trip to Iraq, a couple trips to Afghanistan. Uh, but what led me here to the Department of Physical Education was, and I think we're going to talk about this as part of the podcast, an opportunity to come back here and teach the first time just after company command, and, and that was preceded by a master's degree at the University of Georgia. Um, and then you know that led to a second opportunity, I guess about 10 years ago, to go back to Georgia, earn a doctoral degree under Dr. Kirk Curitan. Uh, and then, you know, here I am in my ninth year. I can't believe time flies, but in my ninth year in the Department of Physical Education. That's unbelievable, sir. No, that, that, that's awesome. 
Uh, one of the questions I wanted to dive into, because I, I don't think a lot of people know this, um, we, we talked about the cool title. Uh, could you talk about like the, the history and like where the name Master of the Sword comes from? Sure. Yeah, so the title's a neat title to have, and, and I, you know, I, I get called that title wherever I go in the world, you know, quite literally. Those trips to Afghanistan, you know, graduates of all ages and all service components, you know, they, they know what the Master of the Sword does and what it stands for because of the, the coursework they matriculated here at West Point. Uh, they usually say it with tongue-in-cheek or, or maybe with a little bit of a, a crooked look, crooked glance um, because of the challenges they were faced with in the department. Uh, but way back when, uh, the Office of Physical Education, Office of Physical Training, taught swordsmanship uh, along with horsemanship here at the academy. And so because we were the, the teachers of swordsmanship for Army officers, the head of the department had the title Master of the Sword. Now, I, you know, I wish people often say, you know, don't I have a, shouldn't I walk around West Point with a sword in my hand or one in close reach here? And as you know, there are a few... Uh, on display here throughout the gym from a historical perspective. But the titles remained uh, for a long, long time. You know, I have to, you know, predecessors like Herman Keeler back at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, who set the stage for what we currently do in the department. General MacArthur and his every cadet and athlete set the stage for what we continue to do in the department. Um, my predecessors, Greg Daniels, Maureen LaBeouf, and and really the one that had a, a really significant influence on me as a cadet, uh, but also on the academy over a long period of time, General Jim Anderson, uh, who was the Master of the Sword from 1974 to 1997. So wow. for 23 years, he held this position uh, before his retirement at the age of 64. And, and he, we, see him, we see him a good bit. He comes up to the academy and uh, up from North Carolina with his family, with his kids. He, he came to our tailgate this past fall. Uh, always good to see him. Uh, he's doing great. No, but yeah, it's, a, it's a, a title that's a it's a privilege to hold. Uh, it's a privilege to do what we get to do here in the department. And, and I'm glad you, you mentioned the, the department because that's that's another. If you're not a West Pointer, I think well kept secret uh, is the Department of Physical Education there. Could could you talk a little bit about that that department, your department, and what it does? Uh, you know, sure. there at West Point. Yeah, we would like to be less of a secret. And I think opportunities like this to speak uh, about what we do, how we do it, and, and who gets to do it, right? Um, so what we do is we develop leaders of character. The Military Academy's mission, we develop leaders of character who are physically fit and mentally tough. And we do that through a rigorous, iterative, and developmental course of physical education curricula. Uh, anything from boxing to military movement, which is an applied gymnastics class, um, combatives, which you taught, um, some classroom classes that really are underpinned by the Army's holistic health and fitness concept, and then some lifetime physical activities. And then, as you know, we also have a kinesiology undergraduate major that was stood up about 11 years ago. Um, you know, where do we do it? We do it right here and where I'm sitting now in the home of the Department of Physical Education and Arvin Cadet Physical Development Center, named for Bob Arvin, uh, class of 1965. Uh, and who does it? Uh, the great people of DPE, you know, you are one of them and always will be. Uh, we have about 71 folks, um, 49 of those are faculty, and about half of those faculty are Title X civilians, and about half are active duty military. So we have a great, a diverse um, set of talent uh, that delivers our curriculum, that supports our program, um, that's all integrated and nested with uh, the SOUP's vision to um, be the preeminent leader development institution in the world and cultivate uh, a culture of character growth. Yeah, th thank you for that, sir. And a great place to work. I'll go ahead and say that. And, and so with that, I also want to say, if I'm an Army officer listening to this, how, and, and I wanna, I'm want to, i interested in DP and, and maybe I want to go teach there, how do, how do you select folks to teach there? How can somebody get and work in the DPE? Yeah, thanks for teeing up that question. So oftentimes it's done by word of mouth. Um, you know, we, I always ask our officers that, that depart here, if they identify an officer, you know, a, a first lieutenant, a young captain who, you know, demonstrates the leader attributes we'd like to have here as role models in our faculty is to encourage them to apply. Because you're right, unless they graduate from the military academy, um, you know, ROTC, direct commissionees, OCS officers, they don't really know 
that this opportunity exists. Uh, we probably need to continue to find innovative ways to get the word out. Um, so it's about that, you know, fifth, sixth, seventh year of service, uh, of officer service, where we'd like them to reach out to us, uh, start their application. And, and West Point has a site. You can do some pretty simple Google search. It's called Teach. Uh, begin to fill out an application. It's a typical application. We're going to want to look at the officer's record brief, uh, their evaluation reports. If they've taken the GRE, we'll want to take a look at that, their transcripts, and we'll have them you know, do a cover letter and provide us letters of recommendation. And ultimately, we'll convene a board here in the department that, that looks at um, all the candidates and selects a, each year about six to seven of the very best qualified candidates and then we work with the Army through by name requests to get them here and, and prior to them coming here we send them to earn a master's degree in exercise science and then they come to the to the department for a three-year utilization tour where, the, where they'll teach, coach, mentor, um, hopefully have a lot, whole lot of fun here in the department and uh, you know, once they're done with that, they'll go back out to their, their basic branch or some do transition to a different career field uh, after their tour here in the department. No, it's, it's a thank you, sir, for, for saying that, because if I wouldn't have stumbled across it, um, I, I would have had no clue. And, and it, it is such a unique experience, uh, awesome Army experience, and particularly for, you know, the, the officers. I, I'm lucky enough that I kind of work in health and fitness, so I've, I've had other jobs like that. Um, but, but for the other officers, a chance to, to go back to school for a year and to focus and to get that education at, you know, great, uh, institutions like Texas A&M, um, right. and, and then come there for, for three years to work with cadets. Uh, it's a lot of fun. And, you know, recently, uh, you've, you've added a dietitian position, uh, to the department. So, so now SPs can get involved. Yeah, no, thanks to you, Nick. And I think, um, you know, given where the army has gone and will continue to go with the holistic health and fitness concept and human performance optimization. No doubt having a registered dietitian here in the department to add, uh, to complement what, we, what we've what we been doing for a long period of time, uh, to work with the physical therapists in, in El Keller Army Community Hospital, and to work with the athletic department and all the things they do for our cadet athletes. You know, it's building that uh, infrastructure, if you will, from the bottom up. Uh, to help cadets see that holistic development that that must occur. You know, you it's one thing to be, and we can talk about holistic health and fitness all day long, but it's one thing to be physically fit, but if that's not built on a foundation of proper nutrition, uh, of of sleep, uh, sleep the proper sleep hygiene, uh, if it's not built on a, a foundation that also includes mental readiness and spiritual readiness, then potentially there, those gaps could be identified in, in those challenging, austere conditions that we uh, require our, our leaders to operate in. Yes, sir. And, and you mentioned holistic health and fitness, and, and we're definitely going to talk about that. How has DPE been involved with the holistic health and fitness? Because that's another piece of it I, I think a lot of folks don't know about. Yeah. So we've been involved indirectly and now more directly. So indirectly, uh, and I'm going to I'm going to throw some names out there because I'm incredibly proud of what these folks have done. Um, so first, Dr. Chip East, who was a member of our faculty for 13 years, and and Chip really came to the Department of Physical Education in the latter half of a, a really good career. Um, spent 13 years here in the department as our director of instruction, or essentially our senior civilian faculty member. Um, before he went on a sabbatical down to TRADOC CIMT, the Center for Initial, Initial Military Training, and was one of the primary investigators for the baseline soldier physical readiness requirements study. It's a mouthful. But that those studies and the physical demand study also, along with the team of folks, led us to the establishment of the OPAT, the Occupational Physical Assessment Test, and the Army Combat Fitness Test. Um, so really proud of Chip and all that he was able to do for our Army for a long period of time, uh, not just here in DP and in USMA, but down at TRADOC. And he recently retired, so best wishes to him and his, his wife, Connie, and their kids and grandkids. And then you got Mr. Uh, Colonel retired, and now Mr. Michael McGurk, also down at TRADOC CIMT, continuing to push uh, H2F and really a lot of the energy behind the ACFT. And then Colonel Kevin Beagleman, who... Um, we both had the privilege of serving alongside of here in the Department of Physical Education. I've known Kevin for a long time. Uh, we both matriculated through 
uh, Dr. Kurt Curitan's program at the University of Georgia and, and worked in his um, metabolism and body composition lab. Uh, and he really still is a mentor today. If we need to reach out to him, I know he's there for us. But And Kevin's been pushing really hard as the director of H2F for Tradoc CIMT. Um, so a lot of credit to them. So indirectly, they'll bounce ideas off of us and we'll provide feedback. But we've, we really didn't do uh, much work at all. So much credit goes to, to those folks and many others um, down there in Tradoc. But more directly recently, we've taken that concept and, and Field Manual 7-22 and integrated it into our curriculum, specifically in PE 215, uh, Foundations of Personal Fitness. Uh, that, of course, it's taken by fourth class cadets or plebes, uh, and then are taken by second class cadets or cows or, or juniors, whatever word you want to use, um, is our Army Fitness Fundamentals that really gets a little deeper into FM 7-22 there's a little bit of NSCA, um, CSCS components that are in there as, as they should be. Um, so it's, it's a really nice uh, bringing together those elements of human performance optimization that our cadets, soon to be lieutenants, are going to need to lead their formations. No, yes, sir. Thanks. Th thanks for that, because I know that there was a lot tied on. And even, even early on, though, with the ACFT, I think uh, West Point was some of the initial data points testing it out. Is that, yeah, is that again, because of our, our relationship with Dr. East, um, he asked us to do some things. Well, I think we took a group of cadets who were going through a pre-ranger program and administered a version of the ACFT. Uh, and then we volunteered to do an over 40, so over the age of 40, because we have that population here and our faculty do a test uh, with that group here. And then with phase one of ACFT implementation, uh, we tested the class of 2019 twice during their final year at the academy before going to phase two and three of the ACFT. And then and then now it's it's our test of records, our physical fitness test of record, and, and cadets have em largely embraced it. Yes, sir. I want to go away from the ACFT for a second and, and talk a little bit about your, your research because, you know, you're, you're an exercise physiologist um, and, and your, uh, your HIT research, your, your high-intensity interval training, um, uh, particularly, we, we got to talk about your burpee study because I love that. But uh, what what drew you to 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 hit training? Uh, I, I guess you know uh, this. So this might be a little bit longer story. I'll try to keep it shorter. Um, you know, so I grew up playing all kinds of sports, and, and really hope kids continue to do that. That's my pitch. Kids, get out and, and be active and play, and you know, find what you enjoy. But uh, my parents introduced me to a lot of different things, and the, the one sport that really stuck with me and still does today was wrestling. And wrestling by its nature and competition is, requires a, a breadth of athleticism, um, requires a great strength to body weight ratio. Um, you know, certainly there's an agility and balance and coordination aspect to it. Um, the technique has evolved from what I first learned back when I was five years old to what I see on the mat with our wrestlers here at Army now. Um, so I think kind of I was always attracted maybe through what I my environment growing up to high intensity activity, kind of pushing yourself to those those limits and then, you know, maybe take a little breather and then do it again. It's kind of the nature of the way we played. Um, but more formally, what got me into that is when I went to the University of Georgia the second time for my doctoral studies, I had just come out of, Af or excuse me, I'd just come out of Iraq and seen, you know, at the tail end of, of um, Operation Iraqi Freedom there, had seen what it was required of our soldiers. And, and I've heard others, you know, kind of call, you know, the battlefield, the anaerobic battlefield, if you will. I, I won't try to define that for anyone. Uh, but it's these kind of intermittent bursts of high intensity activity with periods of maybe lower intensity activity, you know, longer periods of lower intensity activity. So how do you train for that? And so when I got to the University of Georgia, Dr. Curitan and his lab, uh, they had been doing sprint interval training, kind of follow on to a lot of the, the research coming out of um, an institution in Canada. I'm drawing a blank on which one right now. It's not fair to them because they were really doing a lot of the repeat Wingate studies. Was that McMaster? Uh, McMaster, that's McMaster, right. McMaster, yeah. Yeah, McMaster University. And so at the University of Georgia in the lab there, we had started doing some sprint interval training studies. Um, 
Carl Beagleman had been doing them with uh, ROTC cadets. Um, Dr. Jennifer Trilk, Trilk had been doing them with um, uh, some obese samples. And a number of other people that had really started to gain energy. And so I wanted to bring us something a little bit different to it, all right? So, yes, we're doing these, these sprint interval training, repeat wind gates, cycle ergometer work. We don't really ride bikes in the Army. That's not really what we do. We do things that are a little more um, definitely weight-bearing, some oftentimes loaded, um, but certainly a more functional aspect to them. So I kind of started brainstorming some things, playing around the lab with my my buddies down there. Uh, throw uh, shout out to, to Dr. Eric Freeze who works at the Gatorade Sports Science Institute. But um, so we kind of started playing with some things in the lab and assessing acute responses to thrusters. Uh, we did throw burpees in there. I think we did some loaded burpees with a with a weighted vest on at one time. That was challenging, and ultimately settled on all out sprints, but using a burpee protocol. Uh, so for those that aren't familiar with the burpee, it's basically an up, die, up, down, right? Get down, do a push up, get up, jump. And so doing all out efforts, short, very, a very short duration, similar to a wind gate at 30 seconds, followed by periods of active recovery. And so we built, kind of started to build that, re, that protocol and did some studies on the acute responses. I think we've got a few of those published. And then ultimately, you know, the, the evidence comes when you do a training study, right? How effective is this? So we developed a training study, and again, we were able to recruit participants from the RTC program at the University of Georgia, and um, that formed the, the foundation for, um, you know, the rest of my doctoral studies, which was a pretty short time period down there in Georgia, but really enjoyed what I was doing at the time. And so that's kind of the, the brief history of high-intensity interval training um, by Nick Gist. By no means am I, uh, uh, you know, highly published exercise physiologist, but I did enjoy what I got to do and um, hopefully it's helped others, you know, continue to pursue their passions as well. Yes, sir. No, I, I again, I, I came across your, your burpee study, I think when I was at Texas A&M, um, and, and then the, the, the beauty of it was, if I remember correctly, is, you know, you had one group doing burpees and the others doing the typical PT sessions of, of, I think there was a, a running, a calisthenic day, and maybe a ruck um, in there. And then the other group did just burpees. And when they looked at at, at the time of the APFT score, because that was that was our test of record, right. there was there was no significant difference between the two groups. Right. Yet you had one group that did um, a significant less volume of, of training than the other. So it was, it was in terms yeah, of it's, ROI. It's, yeah, it's, it's good. Yeah, no, exactly. I was just going to say that it's return on investment or bang for your buck, however you want to say it. And that's really been the basis behind all that high intensity interval training for the last, you know, 10, 15 years. People have been doing it for years, right? We, we had elite marathoners and, and 10 K runners that have been using intervals forever for a long, long time, if, if you will. Um, but, you know, things often come back full circle and it's like, okay, is this good for the masses? And I think there's a lot of evidence that it is good for the masses and, and other researchers have, you know, used cardiac rehabilitation patients, as I mentioned, you know, patient, patients that are uh, obese or um, older. I, I think we did a study of postmenopausal women uh, that was published. So, yeah, I mean, it, there's some, some strong evidence out there that, um, all-out efforts or near all-out efforts of, of short duration um, can pay off in terms of your, your uh, aerobic capacity. Um, perhaps there are other measures out there to continue to be examined. You know, the other one that I think needs to be looked at too are how, how, does, how do injury rates um, play out with different um, exercise protocols, training protocols, and then the enjoyment aspect as well. You know, some people enjoy those all-out efforts and, and some don't, but ultimately if they enjoy it some and adhere to it, you know, adherence to exercise is, is really the key to probably addressing a lot of the issues that um, face our nation today. Yes, sir. What about, you know, since we, we touched a little bit on research, uh, can you talk about any ongoing research in the DPE or any projects or, or even things you might be looking to do? 
Yeah, so we've been fortunate here to, to team up with Dr. Diana Thomas over in the Department of Math. Um, she is She's a mathematician, of course, um, but she has a deep and broad background in body composition studies, uh, using a number of different estimates of body composition, most recently some 3D imaging. And uh, so we use some 3D imaging, some DEXA, and then we're able to compute some correlations to ACFT performance and just examine, you know, what are some of the variables that can contri could contribute or at least be correlated to uh, relative success on individual events or on the ACFT in the aggregate. Um, so we've teamed up with her on a paper in the Department of Physical Education, and then uh, more recently, um, you know, it, I, this is definitely public, but she was the lead in an effort to bring West Point into the fold on a uh, performance nutrition grant out of NA, NIH. And that's just um, beginning to gain more momentum now, but the, the grant has been awarded. And so uh, it's a privilege for me personally to be part of that. I'm not sure how much I, I have to offer to that effort, but I give a lot of cr credit to Dr. Thomas over the last several years bringing uh, members of our department into those uh, that research. And then even this morning, I was talking to Dr. Drew Van Dam. He came in early today because there's another iteration of data collection for the study that you initiated down in combatives, uh, looking at um, pre-competition um, saliva samples for cortisol response. And so that that has continued um, after you departed, uh, Dr. Van Dam, as, as well as some others teaming up with Eucerium. Again, thank you for you. Thank you for, um, you know, keeping that partnership going. But that's one that continues and look to see uh, publication of those data here in the next, you know, 12 to 18 months. Yes, sir. No, it's great. Great. I mean, West Point is such a unique environment for research in, in terms of, I don't know anywhere else in the Army where you have soldiers for four years eating the same thing, doing the same training, you know, it's... Yeah. Yeah, you often, you know, you, researchers, I think, often want to provide as much control to a, their sample as they can, and you're, you're truly, it, it's really difficult to, uh, for, for human subjects to have a truly controlled environment, but I think this environment does permit some of that because of the, you know, the age group, 18 to 27, they do live here, they do eat here, they do sleep here, and there's a commonality to their activity level um, across, you know, the physical program, the military program, and the academic program. Yeah, it's, 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 it's perfect for research because they're at West Point, but then at the same time, it's extremely difficult for research because they're at West Point <laughs> with, with all the time. Time, it. time is the coin of the realm for sure. And, and getting time, even when you do recruit them, they have a lot of things going on in their lives. Yes, sir. You, I, again, you saw that firsthand and, uh, you know, just before you left with the CLDT study. Yeah. Yes, sir. But, but we made it happen. We got it done. Um, as a leader, so, so kind of uh, uh, switching back here, um, you know, as a leader, as a commander, why do you like the Army Combat Fitness Test? What, what, what makes it so great? That's a, it's, it's a loaded question, but a really good one. I think I like it because for, you know, many, many years, I'll, I'll say like the first 25 years of my career plus the four years as a cadet, you know, all we knew from an assessment, a formal assessment standpoint, was the Army Physical Fitness Test. But also for years, for for those that maybe had kind of this, you know, rock in their shoe, if you will, we often talked about a more comprehensive assessment of fitness that maybe more closely matched what we were experiencing in our operational tasks. And again, me as an aviator, you know, climbing on aircraft, you know, there's an argument to be made. Um, you know, not a lot of physical demands there. Um, but, you know, we're all soldiers, right? And, and I was taught long ago by a mentor, you know, I'm a soldier first who happens to be an aviator with the privilege of being an officer. And being a soldier first, you know, shoot, move, communicate. And so I think the, the ACFT captures that. I mean, that's what it was built upon. It was built upon um, the soldier physical demands, the warrior tasks and battle drills and, and common soldier tasks. And so I think as, as the researchers pulled the string from those warrior tasks and battle drills through to an assessment of fitness where you have, 
you know, three, four, five, six events in this case, a battery uh, that assesses, you know, all components of fitness. Now you have something that's comprehensive, that potentially correlates highly to those warrior tasks and battle drills and what's actually going to be required of us uh, in combat. And um, so it's really neat to see that evolution occur, you know, near the end of what is likely, you know, closer to the end of my career than the beginning. And I think the other aspect that I really like about it, you know, in addition to the comprehensive nature is the camaraderie that comes with it. And I didn't expect that. You know, I, you know, the APFD was an event. It was twice a year. It was, okay, let's go take the APFD. Let's, you know, record on the scorecards and, and upload it to wherever it needs to be uploaded. And it's a, a consideration of, you know, physical fitness as a component of presence, which is a components of our, component of our leader attributes and competencies. Uh, but ultimately now, I think for the for the most part, the people I work around, of course, here in the Department of Physical Education, but I, I stretch that out to the 4,400 um, core of cadets, they've embraced it. And so I think the camaraderie and the embracing of the, the, the demands and the challenge and the understanding of its relevance, its importance, uh, all of those elements come together. And I think people look forward to actually hey, where, see, and where do I stand? Where do I stand in terms of my muscular strength? Where do I stand in terms of my anaerobic power? Where do I stand in terms of my aerobic capacity as the sixth event of a six-event test? Um, and, you know, some of them are very grueling. The sprint and drag carry is grueling, and, and it's neat to see the, um, the cheering that's happening and the, the grittiness that's demonstrated during that event. Um, and then, you know, maybe the one that has, um, has caused some consternation in, in, at various times, and the one that I kind of questioned initially is the leg tuck, because I had never heard of a leg tuck. I had done ankles to the bar, pull-ups, chin-ups, all variations thereof. But the leg tuck was something that was new to everyone, I think. I didn't know anyone who had ever done that alternating grip, knees to elbows. Um, certainly some variations. But the way I've seen people attack the leg tuck and attack other elements that they were, you know, maybe formally a little more deficient in or was a relative weakness, it's been pretty neat to see the progress and the adaptations that are made and the progress that is shown that, that gets borne out in performance, right, or repetitions, if you will. Um, several stories of, of folks that couldn't do a leg tuck and now are doing, you know, five, six, seven, or even up to 15, 16 leg tucks. Or a neat story I've told um, this last summer during cadet basic training, uh, we had a cadet who uh, on the at the end of approximately five and a half weeks of our basic training, taking the ACFT, gets to the leg tucks, and I'm just kind of observing, and this young cadet all of a sudden knocks out five leg tucks, drops down off the bar and says, wow, I couldn't do any when I showed up here on reception day when we took our initial three event um, physical fitness assessment. So to see the, again, I'll just go back to the comprehensive nature of the test, the way uh, many folks have embraced it and, and understood the relevance that comes with it. Um, I, I love it. Now, you know, what comes with that, I don't think we ever want to train for the ACFT. I think we want to train for our job. And if our job requires us to be stronger, faster, more powerful, go longer distances with more load. You know, the leaders are going to have to define that for their organizations based on essential tasks, mission, the environment, and in taking people to those higher levels of performance. Um, I, I think we're seeing a, a culture shift and a very positive culture shift uh, out there, you know, in our operational army, our institutional army, and that's a good thing. It, it's, it's going to be good for us. Yes, yes, sir. No, I, I, I mean, even uh, I haven't obviously been in as long as you have, but just from when I came in to to what PT looked like to now, um, even here at, you know, uh, Joint Base San Antonio, you see a lot of folks out with trap bars deadlifting. Never yeah. saw that before, <laughs> particularly in, in, in the medical centers. Right. That's right. Uh, uh, yeah. Which which, you know, you talk about uh, evacuate evacuating a casualty if you had to. I mean. It's it's very similar to a trap bar deadlift, that's um, right. so so I, I think that's that's great. No, you, you hit that. Um, it, now this is sometimes a, a talk, and I mean, 
Do you think the ACFT favors a body size over the other? Do you think there's a, a an ideal body size for the ACFT, or is that just more opinion? Yeah, you know, so I, ideal. That's a that's a. I don't think there's an ideal body size. I certainly think that certain events favor certain body types or certain body composition, right? Um, ultimately, any any good fitness test is going to favor the fittest person. <laughs> right? <laughs> imagine um, that. <laughs> imagine that. Um, but I do think that, you know, well, let's just, we'll take the events in order, right? So the, uh, max three, three repetition, maximum deadlift, the stronger a person is likely the more they're going to deadlift. Now that's, that's a very simple way of saying that technique is important, right? Because we want to prevent injuries. We don't have to treat injuries. We want to be able to prevent them. So technique and teaching the proper mechanics of a deadlift are important whether it's straight bar trap bar picking up a litter you know all all of those things have slight variations to them but ultimately that loading and those mechanics teaching that um, is important to our to our force so that we prevent injuries but the strongest person of course is is going to have the biggest deadlift i mean we we see that here at the military academy. I'm sure every unit in the army is seeing that as well. It's not a. It's not. There's nothing magical about it, right? Um, you know, the, the standing power throw. I think there's probably, you know, physics will tell us that a moment arm or a lever is going to create greater torque, and that torque is going to result in uh, greater distance where that 10 pound ball is going to travel. Now, again, there's a technique to that, though, right? There's a, the the, the triple extension that leads to a proper release and the most power, the more, most force generated on that ball is going to lead to uh, the greatest throw. But ultimately, you know, I think we ought to be less concerned about the actual numbers in the end and more concerned about the payoff that preparation has. You know, the ACFT is going to be a twice a year mark on the wall that the commander has and can look across those six events and say, hey, I see relative strength, and I use that as a a very broad term, I see relative strength in three of the six events, I see relative weakness in three of the six events vis-a-vis our mission. Okay, now as a commander and as a senior enlisted leader, we got to put a plan together that addresses those relative weaknesses while sustaining those relative strengths. And ultimately, that's how we become a better force is, is embracing growth, having a growth mindset, both physically and mentally. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I think there are certainly advantages um, to being stronger, to being more powerful, to being to having greater aerobic fitness. Um, but in those things are always going to have a genetic component. Can't get beyond that. Uh, there's always going to be the laws of motion that we can't get beyond. That's the, the physical world is the physical world. We can't change that. And then our environment, austere, you know, hopefully not a home game somewhere else. If, if we're called upon to do that, you know, the demands of our profession are the demands of our profession. And so the folks that we call upon to do that, we want them to be the best prepared. And so I think the ACFD helps us get there. It's not the end all be all. It's a component of, of our holistic training. Yes, sir. And, and much better than the APFT. <laughs> uh, one, yeah, much, much, better. <laughs> much better. There we go. That's that. not, you know, I'm not pointing any fingers at the, at the APFT. It had its purpose um, and, and should have, and in many cases was complemented by other assessments. Um, but yeah, the ACFT provides for the, for our entire army, all three components, a more holistic assessment of our fitness. Yes, sir. Any any book recommendations or, or you know reading recommendations you have for for folks wanting to to learn more about holistic health and fitness or, or training as a whole? Oh wow, I hadn't thought about that one. Um, FM seven twenty two or ATP seven twenty two, and it's dot uh, one and dot two. I mean, there's a lot of good material in there. Um, you know, you kind of have to sort through it. Uh, but there's a lot of good material in there. I think uh, Essentials of Strength Conditioning is also a good resource. Um, it's it's more textbook like, but there's still there are a lot of great resources in there. And you know, you just go back to look at the index if you want to find something that you're interested in. The index will take you that information. Um, 
outside of that, you know, we all know today, you know, you go uh, to the World Wide Web, you go on the line and you can find so much, but the challenge is sorting through yeah. that, all of that information, right? The, the influencers, what they put out there um, versus, you know, what, what's backed by science and evidence. And so I, I always, we always encourage, of course, you know, this in our kinesiology program, we're trying to uh, teach our cadets, not necessarily what to think, but how to think. And part of how to think is knowing to go to reputable, reputable resources for information. Um, you know, I, I think another great resource, and you you put me onto this, is Martin Rooney's books. And I know it has nothing to do with, uh, doesn't have a lot to do with holistic health and fitness, but it has a lot to do with leadership. And, and that's you know, High Ten is the most recent book. And prior to that, um, Coach to Coach. I think those are two contemporary um, lessons in how to create a culture. And, and really, you know, whether it's a culture of physical fitness, of mental readiness, um, I, I think creating that culture as a leader's responsibility and, and emphasizing readiness, you know, you, the chief of staff of the Army says it, right? Our job is to build cohesive teams that are highly trained, disciplined, and fit. That's pretty straightforward. Uh, and as leaders, uh, we all need to take that to bear in our, our daily activities. Yes, sir. No, thank you for that. A lot of, a lot of great uh, recommendations there. Sir, I could I could keep talking to you, but I, I want to be respectful of your your time. Uh, you know, thanks so much for for you know coming on today. But then also, you know, thank you for some of the folks might not know. Again, hiring me, I, I didn't go through the typical process, the, the screening process. I, I think we we met by chance. I was uh, on a trip with Usarium, chatted a little bit, kept the conversation going, and then it even took a couple years. I think you, you actually decided you would hire me, and and I, you know, I, I look at that that time I got to spend at West Point, although a little shorter than, than, than maybe both of us would have liked. Um, uh, you know, it, it's just really uh, developmental. Um, taught me how to think about you know certain things. Uh, opened my eyes to a lot of things, and and made some great friends and some great connections out of it. So thank you so much for that, sir. Thanks for saying that, Nick. And and I think likewise, we were fortunate to have you here. And I think it opened my eyes to some different things as well. And, you know, we have a, a dietitian that uh, will join us here on June 1st from the athletic department where she's doing an internship. So that's a good thing. And we'll keep that relationship going. But uh, as, I've, as I've said to the department a number of times, and you probably heard me say it at least once, the impact we have truly is exponential, right? Because you've got a classroom of cadets, to the core of cadets out there as leaders in our army, company grade leaders who influence first platoons, but then companies and eventually beyond. And that's the true nature of our impact is um, our graduates and commissioned officers from the United States Military Academy who take the, the knowledge and passion that you shared with them uh, about performance nutrition, about exercise physiology, about combatives, um, your experiences both in and out of the Army with Ranger Regiment, you know, so broad those experiences. Um, that's the true nature of our influences on our graduates. Thank so thanks you, for that. Glad I could be a part of that. And, and again, thanks, thanks for joining us and, and thanks for listening. Uh, again, listen to the podcast, click uh, subscribe. Uh, we're on Spotify, we're on iTunes, and, and we also have our, uh, we're also on YouTube as well if you want to see the, the video of Colonel Gist and I uh, chatting as, as well. Um, sir, thank you again and, and have a great day. Thanks for having me. Go Army. Be Navy. Be Navy.